Please open your Bible to the second chapter of Paul's epistle to Titus as we continue to discover truth in Titus, a blueprint for the church. As we were reminded earlier in the service by Andrew, uh, any building or facility that's used for church worship is merely just that, a physical building. The church is not a physical building where people meet. It is the spiritual body of believers who, having repented of their sins, have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for their eternal salvation, who meet together for worship, for fellowship, for prayer, for the reading and proclamation of God's holy word. So with that in mind, the title for our consideration this morning is Building a Beautiful Body. And unless you are under some misapprehension, let me immediately explain. I'm not going to be uh, promoting any particular ointment or product to put on your skin to make you look better. I'm not even going to be proposing any particular diet for you, physically speaking, that might put bulk on your physical body. But I do trust that as we get into the Word of God together this morning, we'll enjoy the meat of the Word, which is under the influence, direction, and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, able to make us wise to salvation and also to sanctification. Building a beautiful body, becoming spiritually healthy. The Bible is the divinely inspired, infallible word of the living God inerrant in the original autographs. The Bible does not contain the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. Within the Bible is everything we need to know for what we are to believe and how we are to behave. And the Bible is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. In his epistle to Titus, the Apostle Paul is instructing Titus how he is to conduct himself as he's charged with this enormous responsibility of addressing the problems existing in the churches on the island of Crete. Yes, problems in churches are not a new phenomenon. <laughs> and Paul has given instructions to Titus about the older men, the young, older women, and the younger women. And now when we get to verses 6 through 8, we find Paul is going to focus his attention on the younger men in the churches. Now we're grateful to God that we have younger men attending Grace Bible Church, so this portion of God's holy word will be highly relevant to you this morning. It will also provide guidance for all of us concerning what we should all expect of the younger men in the church. Hear the word of the Lord, Titus 2, 6 through 8. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible in all things. Show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame having nothing bad to say about us. If you've never considered these words carefully before now, please listen and hear what I'm saying. What you don't know can hurt you. The Bible itself is very clear about that. Hosea 4.6, people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You ignore the word of God to your peril. In verse 6, Paul is instructing Titus to urge the young men to be sensible. Now we all know that young men are frequently impulsive, passionate, ambitious, sometimes volatile, and 
sadly, sometimes downright arrogant. And it's interesting to see that Paul is requiring Titus to address these younger men rather than doing it himself. You'll remember that he instructed that the older women were to uh, instruct the younger women. But in this particular case, he's not saying the older men should instruct the younger men. He's saying to the younger man, Titus, who is a relatively mature believer being charged with serious responsibility that you will be able better to relate to these young men and you need to communicate directly to them on these important things. Very often, younger men respond internally, if not outwardly, when older men give them guidance and instruction. They think to themselves, uh, they should be free to do whatever they like. And it's interesting that Solomon had very good advice for young men. He wrote in Ecclesiastes 12.1, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw nigh, when you will say, I have no delight in them. You want to live a life with no regrets? You need to begin right now. And I'll tell you why. It takes a lifetime to build a good reputation. But you can lose that reputation in one single foolish action. And once it's lost, it can be a long and very difficult process to recover it again, if that is even possible. The changes in the education of children in the public schools have resulted in a rebellious and independent mode of thinking, which in turn has resulted in a generation which has degenerated into sinful and primarily sexual depravity. And yes, I'm speaking clearly and strongly at this point. At the same time, while this has been happening, many parents have almost completely departed from obedience to the biblical instructions which are related to the discipline of their children. Little Johnny may be walking with his parents and either daddy or mummy tells him not to walk away and explore something that has caught his attention. But little Johnny completely ignores the command or instruction of his parents and continues to walk away. And instead of demanding and requiring his obedience, mummy and daddy just shrug their shoulders and say, well, he's just a little boy, he'll grow out of it one day. Don't you believe it? They acquiesce, they follow little Johnny to whatever he wants and wherever he wants to go. And at that moment, the battle is already lost. Johnny believes he can do whatever he wants to do with absolutely no regard for any consequences. Is it any wonder that young people today get into trouble so quickly and easily? Titus 2, 6 through 8. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine and dignified. It may just possibly to surprise you to know that young men are not always sensible. <laughs> but what's more, they often believe they know much more than their parents, who lived many more years than they have, and over those years accumulated from life experience a significant level of wisdom and common sense. I've had the enormous privilege of traveling very extensively during my lifetime, not only internationally, but here within the United States and Canada. And one of the places which I visited on one occasion was the Grand Canyon. You may not have come across it, but there's a, a, a very fascinating book that's been written entitled Over the Edge. <laughs> Just from the title, you can guess what the contents are about. 
It tells the stories of all of the deaths that have occurred recorded in the Grand Canyon. It's a fascinating book, and the authors of the book conclude that most, the most vulnerable group at the Grand Canyon who get into trouble is the young men who think they're invincible. And often to prove their bravado, they do foolish things on the edges of the canyon or in other areas where it's dangerous. Sadly, often resulted in the death of these same young men. These young men, I believe we would all agree, are not sensible. But probably the most frequent exercise of lack of true wisdom by young people of both sexes today, although primarily by young men, is when they get behind the wheel of a car, a truck, or ride a motorcycle. What do you think that Titus would have to say to young men today? Especially those young men who profess to be Christians. I can tell you exactly what Titus would say. How is that so? Because it's recorded right here in the text of Holy Scripture. He would say, be sensible in all things. Does that describe you? There's a very solemn passage in the book of Ecclesiastes written by one of the wealthiest and wisest men who ever lived. He said this, Rejoice, young man, during your youth, and let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood. Follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes, yet know this, God will bring you to judgment for all these things. Solomon is not just spouting off theories here. He's speaking from solid personal experience. How do I know that? What does it mean? He had 700 wives. He had 300 concubines. Now a concubine, in case you are not aware, is a woman who lives with a man as if she were his wife, but without having the same status as a wife. And the Bible says in 1 Kings 11.3, his wives turned his heart away from God. Solomon himself grew disgusted and dissatisfied with all of the sensual pleasures of the flesh, and he summed up his experience of life in two expressions. Ecclesiastes 1, 1, he said, it's all vanity, it's all vexations of spirit. And in chapter 20, 12, verse 14, he said, God will bring every act to judgment, and hear this, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. One very highly respected Christian writer stated, a love of sinful pleasure will give the tone to your conversation, which will be vain, loose, and unprofitable, if not obscene, filthy, and profane. Jests or jokes against religion, sneers at the piousness of the godly, irreverent and shocking swearing and a boastful parade of immoralities they have committed, the females they have seduced or the revels in which they have shared make up the conversation of some circles. And this is so tragically sad. Let me tell you why. Because speech is a wonderful gift from God. And it's one of the distinguishing factors between man and the animals. What is the origin of the things you say? From where do they come? Once again, the Bible has the answer. Matthew 15, verse 18. The things 
which come out of the mouth come from the heart, and those things defile the person. Nothing more definitely proves a depraved heart than bad language. There's probably nothing which has a more polluting effect on the imagination or a more hardening influence on the heart than filthy, obscene, and profane conversation. And the man who can even listen to it with pleasure must have already himself have become vile and is hourly becoming more so. And as serious as that statement is, listen to the word of God. Psalm 139. Verse 1, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know. He knows everything because he is omniscient. That is part of his nature as God. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. Even more. You understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest you're aware of all my ways. Before a word is even on my tongue, you know all about it, Lord. You have encircled me. You have placed your hand on me. And this extraordinary knowledge is beyond me. I'm unable to reach it. Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven... You are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I live at the eastern horizon or settle at the western limits, even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand will hold on to me. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light around me will become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night shines like the day. Darkness and light are a light to you. In fact, there is no such thing as darkness. There is only absence of light. So what do young men need today? They need to be regenerated by the Holy Spirit. They need to be born again of the Spirit and be renewed in the spirit of their minds under a conviction of sin they must have repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no other way to be saved. You must be justified by faith and have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You must be sanctified by the truth and the Spirit of God. And the Bible is very clear. Without, are you listening? Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. I don't know how that impacts you, if it does at all, but it certainly does me and challenges me to the very core of my being. We're living in a period of time when evil is rampant everywhere, and the grace of God which brings salvation must teach our young men to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present evil world. As we move into verse 7, we find the Apostle Paul is declaring clearly how Titus is to conduct himself. Now, this is interesting because the focus has changed here. He's been talking about the young men, and now he's talking about how Titus, who is to address the young men, is to be an example. In all things, verse 7, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine and dignified. I'm sure you've heard the popular expression, <laughs> don't do as I do, do as I tell you. Look at verse 7 again. Paul didn't say to Titus, tell them. He said, show them. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good things. Certainly, he'd been speaking to Titus about 
his exhortations to the young man. But now he's saying, you have to live the life, you have to show them yourself what that life means. You have to be their example. And in fact, Paul wrote more about Titus the example than he did about Titus the exhorter. Titus was himself to be what he wanted others to be. Not only to confront them with spiritual words, but a spiritual life that was surely and truthfully in keeping with those words. Which produces a question. Does what your life show validate what you say with your lips? The fact is that even our most forceful, our most compelling arguments will fall on deaf ears if our lives and if our actions fail to back up what comes up out of our lips. Verse 7, in all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine, dignified. In all things. So how can we possibly hope to obey this very strong exhortation every day, moment by moment? I've been privileged to meet many great Bible expositors during my lifetime and one named Major Ian Thomas was well known throughout the British Isles, a tremendous Bible teacher with an emphasis on prophecy and spiritual life. He said, the truth is, we can't possibly hope to do this. We can't live to this standard, but God, through his Holy Spirit, can, and he has told us he would through the indwelling, supernatural, in enabling power of the Holy Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20. First word, four letters. There are some four-letter words which are good. Flee from sexual immorality. Probably one of the best examples in the Word of God of this is the situation Joseph was in. When Potiphar's wife came on to him, wanted him to have an improper and inappropriate relationship with her, he ran as fast as he could and as far as he could. Every other sin a man can commit is outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God with your body. You see, the problem is if, if the example doesn't follow the advice, anybody giving it will be viewed, and rightly so, as a complete hypocrite. Hypocrisy never promotes righteousness, no matter how sound and biblical a person's teaching and counsel may be. People may, in fact, be inclined even to accept the principles intellectually, but they'll see no reason for living by them. Like their teacher, they in themselves will become hypocrites. Titus was to live so that his life would impress itself on others with good works, sound doctrine, dignified, decent attitude, and sound speech so that not even a hostile enemy could condemn him. The speech of Titus and every spiritual leader and every young man should be such that they can stand without rebuke. In all things, verse 7, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine, dignified. You see, the issue here is very simple. What you believe will always affect how you behave. 
That's why we continually refer to the Bible, which contains everything we need to know for what we are to believe and how we are to behave. The life of Titus must show clearly evidence of purity in doctrine. That's in complete contrast to the deceitfulness of the false teachers. The Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2 says, We have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in trickery, not distorting the word of God, but by the open proclamation of the truth, commending ourselves to every person's conscience in the sight of God. Now the Greek word used here for purity in doctrine means li literally incorruptible. It conveys the idea of not being morally corrupt and vile. Purity in word and in deed and life is an inescapable requirement in the life of every believer. And this is precisely where we find ourselves up against the problem. Because in recent years there's been quite a radical shift from pure doctrinal preaching and teaching in churches in favor of a much more entertainment-oriented uh, approach to things of the faith. So we have many people attending church, and I've met them. Churches where I've been privileged to minister the Word of God as I've stood at the door shaking hands with them as they leave, many of them will say, I really enjoyed that thinking that that would make me happy. Actually, it disappoints me. Part of my concern was that God the Holy Spirit would bring conviction of sin and repentance to the hearts of those who were there. Not necessarily that they would enjoy a nice time, a happy experience. These people that come to church and enjoy church every week are hopelessly and unable to articulate the faith that they at least profess to believe. And the Greek word for pure means not corrupted. It focuses on the teaching which Titus will bring. It wasn't to be corrupted with false doctrine that would spoil and not nourish his heroes. Pure doctrine, sound, healthy doctrine are one and the same. And purity in doctrine assumes there is, listen, an objective knowable standard for pure doctrine. That is, of course, the divinely inspired, infallible word of the living God. In fact, the Greek word for, for doctrine, didiscalia, means word study. It carries the connotation of teaching or instructions. It pictures a process that, 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 that has the effect of shaping the will of those who hear. If you listen to what I just said about the process of shaping the will of the one instructed, you'll also understand that this inevitably means and requires teaching of pure, sound doctrine. Much more than a mere academic exercise, it is intended to produce real change in the lives of the hearers. Now there's another problem, because by nature, all of us are resistant to change. I was speaking with a lady on one occasion when she said, said to me, John, just, that's just the point. You see, I don't want to be changed, and I don't want to change anything. Correct instruction in biblical doctrine and understanding of it will inevitably produce change in the lives of the hearers. God doesn't intend for us to be saved and stuck. He doesn't expect that we'll be merely pew dusters who come to church on Sunday morning and take the dust off the seat on which we sit. He expects and intends that our lives should daily be changed more and more into his divine likeness as we understand his truth. Show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine and dignified. What does dignified mean? It means living with a seriousness that is fixed on God and which honors everything that honors him. 
It includes the idea of living your life in such a way so that it invites, attracts, and inspires reverence, honor, and respect, ultimately of God and his glorious gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ himself gave a similar instruction. He said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before people that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. There's also an implication here that you might miss, and that is we need to be able to distinguish between what is important in life and what is trivial. <laughs> and boy, is that a, a, a something that's sorely needed today. So many people are absolutely caught up with the false sense of the importance of the trivial, temporary things of this life instead of seeking to honor God in the things that are eternal. In 1 Timothy 3, 4, Paul writes that an elder must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control, are you listening, with all dignity, the same word. And that means that we should never ever make light of the Bible or use it as the basis for a stand-up comedy routine. There are some preachers who make quite a point of keeping their congregations roaring with laughter, and it may seem entertaining at the time, but by the end of the sermon, what is the overall effect? It is only to make a big joke out of the Bible. Paul is saying those who preach must communicate the seriousness of these eternal truths, and Titus is to teach sound doctrine. Verse 8. He is to be sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. When you live a life under the control of the Holy Spirit, you can be, as I have been on a number of occasions, in the company of ungodly people who will use bad language and blaspheme the name of our God, and then will suddenly stop almost as if somebody put up a sign in front of them and they'll say, oh, uh, pardon me, I don't want to offend you. I know you're a, a Christian. Does that happen with you or do you just join in and be one of the boys or girls, as the case may be? Titus' speech is to be free from anything to which exception might be taken. It should be free from side issues, from do doctrinal novelties, from fag a fads and crude conversation. When he spoke, whether formal teaching or informal conversation, it was to be sound, healthy, edifying, life-giving, appropriate, and finally, beyond reproach. How does that happen? Well, one way is by thinking biblically at all times. If your heart and mind are set on the word of God and his priceless truth, it will reflect in your conversation and your responses to others. Your conversation should reveal the fact that you are a child of God. Does yours? Here in Titus, Paul is referring to an adversary or an enemy, indicating those people who oppose the gospel and are contrary, antagonistic, adversarial to the one who lives out the gospel. One time in his past, Paul himself had embraced an adversarial attitude himself. He tried to prevent the gospel from being preached. And in recounting his life story of waging a savage and unremitting campaign against the gospel, he, he recalled and recorded in Acts chapter 26, verse 9, I thought to myself, I had to act in strong opposition to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Paul knew very well the character of those he grouped together as the opponent. Now times may have changed, and they have, but the heart of sinful man has not. So you can be very well assured that when you live out the gospel in the workplace or in the community, you will encounter and experience 
the opposition of the enemy. And when an opponent, opponent of the gospel of Jesus Christ makes a, a rash criticism or unfounded charge against you as a believer, it should be so obvious in your life, well known by those around you, that they are embarrassed by their false criticism. True effectiveness of evangelism doesn't come from man-made methods, strategies, or marketing techniques. It comes from mural, moral purity and godliness, which are the proof of the truth of God's word and the power of the living Christ to redeem men from sin. That's what silences the critics. Our letter, Paul writes about believers, you are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Paul was saying of those believers, everybody knew them. They knew what they stood for. They knew what they believed and they watched how they behaved. Writing to the Thessalonians, Paul encouraged them. He said that you become an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. Someone did say one time, you may be the only Bible someone ever reads. Those who oppose sound speech are put to shame because they cannot find a chink in the armor of the believer. There is, are you listening? There is no argument as effective as a holy life. So Titus and all of us must be certain that our walk matches our talk. Paul wrote to motivate the Philippian saints. He said, do all things without grumbling and disputing that you may prove yourselves to be blameless, innocent, children of God beyond reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. And this broadens the spectrum out from Titus's teaching to his everyday speech. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so it will give grace to those who hear. A few verses later, he adds this, immorality, impurity, or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. There must be no filthiness, silly talk, coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. And other verses in context command us to put off angry or bitter words, yelling, cursing, gossip, and slander. So how do we measure up? Younger men must set examples of good deeds. They must be pure in doctrine, dignified in how they teach and live it. They must be examples of sound speech that is above reproach. And the result of living like that is not that the critics will vanish. <laughs> You live like that and you will still face opposition. But there's an application here for every Christian. If you take a stand for Jesus Christ, unapologetically, unequivocally, you will become the object of attack against your character. It will be impugned and your beliefs. You see, the problem is ungodly people are threatened by those who proclaim or exemplify God's holy standards for living. We see it all the time. Unbelievers attack biblical Christians, accusing us of trying to impose our morality on our country. So if you speak out for Christ, expect to be attacked. And someone has put it this way, make sure there's nothing in your life that would bring shame to the gospel if it came to light. If you engage 
let me be very blunt, in homosexual activities, don't tell people you're a Christian. The two are completely incompatible. If you have a secret lover, don't profess to be a pro-family evangelical Christian. You are not. If you're addicted to pornography on the internet, don't give the impression that you're a, a good family man. Through these kind of hypocrites, the enemy has plenty of bad things to say about Christians, and even worse, about the Savior they profess. A man attended a meeting where the guest speaker was extremely long-winded. I see some of you smiling. When the man could stand it no longer, he got up and he slipped out of the side door. And as he walked down the corridor, he met a friend. And the, the friend said, has he finished yet? Yes, the man replied, he's been through for a long time, but he's not aware of it. He simply won't stop. The idea of actually coming to the point and saying something worthwhile is good counsel for us when we speak with others every day. If we're honest with ourselves, we must admit that much of our conversation is really not much more than empty talk. And even in that, we need to be cautious. Matthew 12, 36, every idle word men speak will give account for it in the day of judgment. Psalm 141, 3, David knew this. He said, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. It's not easy, but it's necessary. All of us, not just Titus, all of us need to be and to do what God wants us to be and do. That's how together we're all involved in the wonderful process of building a beautiful body. Only to be what he wants me to be every moment of every day. Yielded completely to Jesus alone. Every step of this pilgrim way. Just to be clay in the potter's hands ready to do what his word commands, only to be what he wants me to be every moment of every day.